by the legislature and the governor. Uh, they're an important part of making the policies that we talked about, uh, the benefit designs that we talked about possible. Um, they're extraordinarily engaged and extraordinarily supportive of the work that we do. Uh, one of them is here today. And so if I could, I'd like to introduce Paul Fear, who's one of the current California board members, to say a few words. Paul? Hi, I'm really happy to be here today. I'm excited to be a part of one of these kickoff meetings for the what is now the fifth I think, or annual enrollment. It's hard to believe. I've been on the board of Cover California since inception. It's been a pretty exciting ride. Um, over those four or five years and been really pleased by our success and I'm looking forward to another successful year. Um, and you know, we all recognize that we're <clears throat> surrounded by uh, uncertainty and you know, there are unfortunately new things that happen almost daily, weekly, whatever. But I think we uh, as an organization and all of our partners are extremely well organized uh, for this year and prepared uh, in a whole variety of ways to face the challenges that we're going to have. So I think it's a pretty exciting year. Um, there are a lot of new things. You'll be hearing new things um, in this session, so it's really important to um, really attend to what's new, what's different, whether it's not just premiums, but planned products and networks and the whole array. Um, so in any case, I really appreciate the wonderful work of all of you uh, we would not be successful without um, our partners. I think you probably all know that uh, our enrollers of various sorts and types uh, are responsible for more than, I think, 50% of the enrollment um, in Covered California. So your role is absolutely fundamental <coughs> to our success. Um, and we, I can't uh, overemphasize the appreciation we have of all the work you guys do. Thanks, Paul. I also got so excited I set my clicker down. Oh, here we go. Okay. So changes are coming to the um, plans for the 2018 plan year. The largest one that you've probably heard a bit about and we'll talk about today is Anthem is reducing their footprint. Um, I put this in some bit of context. They're, um, they're going to be remaining in three rating ratings across the state. Um, well, actually, let me just quickly. Um, the, Blue Shields HMO is expanding to some of the Bay Area counties here and also Ventura County. Um, HealthNet is adding a PPO product and partially, partially removing some of their HMO products. Um, and Oscar is expanding that up. Um, Anthem is, so back to Anthem. Anthem is remaining in three rating regions across the state Santa Clara, Northern California, and the Central Valley. Uh, the rest of the rating regions that they had previously participated in, they will not for the 2018 plan year. In context, though, about 100,000 consumers who have Anthem coverage in 2017 will be able to keep that coverage in 2018. Uh, of course, the opposite side of that coin is about 150,000 consumers who have Anthem coverage in 2017 on the exchange will have an opportunity to select a new plan during renewal or open enrollment for the 2018. There are some nuances here, so I want to talk about them quickly. Um, we commissioned some analysis. 84% of the doctors that were in the Anthem network in 2017 are in some other health plan or contracted with some other health plan uh, in 2018. So 84% of consumers can very likely keep their doctor by shopping this year at open enrollment or renewal. Of course, the inverse is always true. Um, so some consumers won't have that opportunity, but the vast majority will. Um, also, just as a quick analysis, Blue Shields Network represents 79% of those doctors. So um, there are some places in the state, um, unlike San Francisco, where there are fewer options. And so um, we know that continuity of care and relationship providers is awfully important. And so we think that while this will be disruptive to some consumers and changes hard, um, there, that analysis to understand the provider networks was a really important one and, and largely positive. We're also adding a new tool to our shopping prepare tool this year. 
uh, that will help consumers through that shopping process we're calling the provider search tool. It is actually embedded in our shop and compare tool. Um, and so I think that's why you see that screen there. It shows you how to enter the information in the shop and compare tool, which you all know very well. Then you're able to enter in the name of your doctor and your zip code um, as a part of the process. And you can enter doctor's names, hospital's names, clinic's names, uh, then select multiple. So you, it's not a one at a time tool. If you, I like Dr. Drew and Hospital X. Uh, you, can, you can see them all. I, I would note just quickly, uh, uh, phone numbers are not included in the tool. It's name and address. The tool is going to be very helpful. We have done an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of work on data cleanup, on working with the plans, um, on accuracy. Some of you may recall, just as a fun history lesson, uh, we launched a provider directory during the first open enrollment period. In theory, that tool is very important. In practice, that tool is a challenge. And um, so we learned from our lessons. We think the work we've done is very good. Uh, that said, the most important provider directories are the ones offered by the carriers. And so while we think this tool will be largely effective and the data will be largely uh, well maintained, uh, it's always a good best practice to check with your carrier just to ensure that providers are participating. Um, so then when you see your shop and compare results, you'll see the things you've always seen, your monthly premium, your APTC, some basic information about the benefit design, and then you would be able to see are the doctors and hospitals that you selected participating with each of the plans. Um, there will also be one screen that will show you facilities and whether or not they are in and out of network. Uh, we think this is well timed given Anthem's a reduction in footprint, and so this tool shall launch, we think, on October 11th, on or after October 11th. We'll talk a little bit about, about why there's a little bit of flexibility in that date, uh, also. Uh, the last thing I know, how many of you guys are certified insurance agents? Many of you, and then just keep your hands up if you have an Anthem off exchange book. Many of you, okay. Um, <laughs> Some research indicates that as much as 30% or a third of the off-exchange market may be subsidy eligible. Uh, that's a lot. And there's a variety of reasons why that could have happened. Uh, if a consumer does not receive a 1095A at the end of the year, they can't collect subsidies. Uh, there are about 100, somewhere between 100 and 100, 150,000 consumers off-exchange um, direct, renewal directly through Anthem, that if they don't make a new plan selection, won't we'll have coverage in the 2018 plan year. The, that population is awfully important, uh, both because coverage is important, but also to keep in the risk pool. Um, I know that you all will be working very closely with your consumers to show them their options and get them covered in 2018. I would encourage you to encourage them to see if they're eligible for a subsidy through that process. Uh, premiums are rising, we're going to talk about the rates in 2018. It's, in some ways they're quite moderated, um, particularly here in the Bay Area. But making sure that consumers benefit from ABTC if they're eligible for it is an important thing. And so as you're helping your off-exchange consumers, we think that 30% of your off-exchange book represented in this room um, that is eligible for subsidy could come on exchange and we think that would be very positive. I'm going to pause there quickly. Um, the one, I guess I'll just make one other note and then I'll circle back to it in more detail because I know you guys will ask me about this now. Um, an Anthem consumer in current California's marketplace, if they do not select a plan at renewal, so they don't come in and actively renew, they will be passively renewed into the lowest cost plan in their metal tier. That does have big implications. So that could be going from Anthem's PPO product to Kaiser's HMO product. There are big implications there. However, if you don't actively renew on the exchange and you're losing your Anthem coverage, you'll be passively renewed into the lowest cost plan in your metal tier. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time answering questions on that particular point just because I, I promised it. Uh, We'll speak about it in more detail later, but that said, um, any questions on what I've just covered? Um, a 
other questions on Anthem's reduction in footprint? So on the provider search tool, how often is it updated internally between the carrier and Covered California? Weekly. Bi monthly. Monthly. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just want to show you these slides quickly. I, I'm not going to go through every one. Every year the federal government uh, puts out new regulations on benefit designs. I think you're asking about federal benefit designs earlier. Um, we have a plan management advisory committee that meets regularly. Um, again, plan representatives, consumer advocates, agent representatives, uh, sort of a broad group of uh, folks. And we make relatively minor adjustments to the benefit designs year over year. Largely they're informed by requirements from the federal government. These slides show you the minor differences that are happening to those benefit designs. To my mind, uh, the changes are largely shielded from our consumers because of our patient-centered benefit designs. So uh, maximum amount of pocket is, a, is an important number to know. Um, but it's important to also know that you're not reaching your max out of pocket for the utilization of outpatient services, because we're mentioning science as an example. Um, so anyways, uh, I, I know I clicked through those very quickly, but just because they're sort of technical in many ways, and you guys will get a copy of them. Excuse me. Can yes. You, can you repeat that? I couldn't hear you. You were mumbling. Uh -oh. <laughs> I apologize. No, I'm a mumbler. That's I, right. I don't object. Oh, thank you. For the maximum out-of-pocket, you said something about outpatient services don't afford that? Yeah, consumers don't have to reach their deductible or their max out, you know, they don't have to reach their deductible in order to utilize any outpatient services. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the max out-of-pocket changing is still, uh, the, our benefit designs are still between consumers and their max out-of-pocket. So uh, you know. So again, if you go to a uh, if you have a primary care visit and a silver plan, it's forty dollars. Uh, you're not reaching your deductible in order to have your insurance kick in. No, I understand that. But the maximum out of pocket, once you reach that, I assume you don't pay anything for doctor visits. That's right. That's all. That was. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. That's a moment. That's one. That's one. Um, quality rating system. We included this too as an FYI. Um, you guys see this every time you shop and compare, and, and maybe um, you think, gosh, what are those stars mean? Um, California, in many ways, led the way on implementing quality rating system uh, to help consumers select a plan. I sometimes like to think it sort of like Yelp, uh, but for health plans. Um, they're one to five as star ratings, and the plans are compared next. 300 plans across the nation. Um, they are evaluated by a rating region. Uh, this would give you an example of what the quality rating system for each plan looks like. I want a variety of factors, uh, both clinical and consumer feedback. Uh, that those slides, uh, those are the stars that you see in the Shop and Compare tool, and it's just another another tool to help consumers pick the right plan for them. Uh, the quality ratings are all located on our website. If you were interested, in go ahead and check them out. They cover CA.com. Okay. <coughs> yes, ma'am. How do you guys go about with the ratings? I mean, similar to CMS and Medicare, they have certain <coughs> protocols. So, how do you guys go about getting two stars for Blue Shield and four or five stars for Kaiser? Who determines the stars? Do you guys call members? Do you got based on what guidelines? Good question. Yeah. Good question. There's some plans that there are no stars. How do you guys do it? What is it? How do you guys do it? Um, I'm going to phone a friend on this one and get back to you. Is that okay? Can I circle back with this answer after the break? That's not fair. <laughs> you think it's not fair. And I know next to this, so I'm going to have it. I'm going to phone a friend to get back. Is that okay? I promise, after the break, at the break, I'll get on the phone. And I'll call people much smarter than me, and that's a low bar. Um, and then we'll, we'll get you guys a better answer here. Okay. Um, the 
rates went to the regulators in California on August 1st, so the rates I'm going to share with you today are preliminary. Um, rates aren't final until the regulators have uh, are done reviewing them. They have 60 days to review the rates. Uh, the regulators in California, as a reminder, the California Department of Insurance, which regulates one of our health net products, and uh, California Department of Managed Health Care, um, again, some representative which is here today, who regulates the remainder of those products. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the cost sharing reduction issue that I mentioned earlier. Uh, talk about the premiums by state and by region, and then I'll take any questions you guys have. Sound good? Okay. Uh, the statewide average increase for premiums this year, the weighted average increase, was 12.5%. Uh, that is down slightly from the 13.2% that we saw last year. And I think it's important to talk a little bit about some of the primary factors that drive rates. Um, the medical trend this year, medical and pharmacy trend put together represents somewhere between six and nine percent of the premium increase this year. So trend is sort of the foundation that often you'll see uh, premiums built on. Uh, Peter, our executive director, likes to say that medical trend was at seven percent this year, so uh, seven percent is sort of also Peter's standing goal first. Way to average increase is fun fact. Um, so, uh, twelve and a half percent. Uh, a couple, one other driver in particular I would note, Congress, I guess two years ago now, passed the health insurance tax holiday. Uh, last year there were uh, changes going on, including the end of the reinsurance program, and that was creating some one-time adjustments in order to mitigate the premium increases from those changes. Um, they passed a law which basically said the health plans didn't have to pay the health insurance tax for one year. The health insurance tax is coming back in 2018. Uh, on average, that represents about 3% of our premium increase. Um, put extraordinarily optimistically, um, we think that means that had it not been for the health insurance tax holiday, our average increase would have been 9.5% this year, um, which is still higher than we would like to see, but in many ways, business is in good shape. It is fair to say that there has been some instability, or at least fear of instability in markets across the nation, given some of the things that are happening federally. And, <coughs> And so there is some adjustment for instability when, when actuaries are creating rates. And lastly, um, four years seems like a long time, uh, but certainly it's fair to say that plans continue to evaluate the risk in their plan and <coughs> understand the population and the utilization of services from that population to sort of get the rates right. So we do see some adjustments there. I think the other thing I really want to point out here is that uh, I know that changing health plans is hard and, and, and not right for every consumer. But if a consumer were to move, if every consumer in California's marketplace were to move to the lowest cost product in their metal tier, so that's not going from platinum to bronze, but that's staying in silver, uh, the average increase would be 3.3%. Shopping was a quality that largely didn't exist before the Affordable Care Act. Uh, if you were able to get coverage, you were likely with the carrier you got coverage from. One of the benefits of the ACA and the exchange environment is every year you can find out what's right for you and your family in your checkbook. And, um, and so we, we always encourage consumers to shop and look at their, you know, their options. Lastly, um, these are projections based on last past history. So if the MLR in this next coming year is in fact um, not necessarily an excessive income, then there should be a rebate check that went back to that member if the guess is wrong, essentially, right? Uh, so these essentially, are, well, we actually, have... these increases are excessive, and then by the end of plan year 2018 to so 2019, they check theoretically it comes to a member if in fact. Theoretically, that is correct. I will say that the regulators aren't done reviewing the rates, and so excessive or not, unclear. Okay. Uh, that Covered California is uh, unique in our exchange model in a variety of ways. One of them is that we negotiate every year with the health plans, so we kick the tires awfully hard um, in understanding premium increases, understanding the drivers, and as much as we seek to mitigate premium increases, we do also feel that we very well understand where they come from and why they happen. Um, these, oh, just, I get this question sometimes, so I'll just remind you. Um, if we took all the premium increases and averaged them together, that would be an average increase. Uh, we give weight 
to the size of the enrollment in the product and, and then use that to average, and so that's a weighted average increase. So these numbers are locked in, assuming no changes from the regulators. Uh, Mary's not actually going to make the changes, I just keep pointing at her as the representative. <laughs> The last thing I would note is there is no such thing as an average consumer. And I totally understand that. Uh, I am sure no consumer comes into your office and says, so, what's the weighted average increase this year? Right? <laughs> what, they, what they do come in is, what do I have to pay this year? What are my options this year? So we talk a bit about um, averages because I think they're helpful to understand the big picture. Um, but Part of why we come today and part of why our partnership is so important is because you guys do the most important work of helping consumers find what's right for them. And we acknowledge that it's very important. Um, again, in the spirit of fun averages, this is the uh, average increase Northern California versus Southern California. I think the only noteworthy thing, uh, maybe not the only, but a noteworthy thing here is that for the first time since we opened our doors, the Northern California weighted average increase is less than the Southern California weighted average. So we won one, guys. Yay. Okay. Um, as I noted earlier, we have a distribution of our enrollment through five large health plans in California with some really important strategic players uh, that offer regional coverage with really strong enrollment in those regional partners. A Chinese Community Health Plan being the one, uh, in Valley Health Plan, rather, being the two here. Um, on the right side of that slide, the good news is the vast majority of enrollment is in the silver medal tier. As you guys know, the silver medal tier is the place where consumers can get cost sharing reductions, sometimes also called enhanced silver benefits. Uh, pretty strong enrollment in the bronze tier, that's something we will continue to look at. Um, California has now the second healthiest risk profile of any state in the nation. For the first years, we were the first, and so we'll decide better about that. Uh, but what we can get back, we can get. Um, there may very well be good, young, healthy folks, 20-somethings and 30-somethings, who um, are able to benefit from the four doctor's visits or four specialty visits that are not subject to the deductible and the bronze plan, who uh, want to have coverage if they go snowboarding and break their leg, uh, but aren't high utilizers of care. So that 21% could be really well selected we actually are working with the plans on um, claims data so we can better understand populations like this to see are people selecting bronze and then it not meet their needs or are they selecting bronze and use, using it in a way that doesn't even meet their needs. So uh, we'll continue to look at that little chunk, but largely good news, 61%, or 64% rather, in silver. Okay, cost share and reduction surcharge. This is relatively dense. I'm going to try and go through as slowly as I can, and then I will answer any questions about premium, premium increase, or cost sharing for search terms. Does that sound fair, fun? Maybe not fun, but fair. Okay. I know you guys know this, but again, as a quick reminder, the Affordable Care Act created two subsidy programs. Uh, this used to your question. Okay. Um, APTC, which is the premium assistance that consumers receive. Uh, well, they don't receive it, it goes from the government to the health plan to make the amount they pay when they go, but uh, their premium less expensive, so that's ABTC. And then there are cost sharing reductions, which all cars call CSRs. CSRs is the money that the government pays for the plans to make their out of pocket costs less expensive. Uh, CSRs are available to consumers between 138 and 250% of the federal poverty level. Um, and there's just a little income chart there for you. 48%, so nearly half, of covered California consumers receive the cost sharing reduction subsidies. So almost half of consumers who enroll in coverage uh, pay less when they go see their doctor than they would have otherwise given the benefit size. Any, do we, we understand this, any questions just about APC or CSR before I move on? Are you guys pros? Okay. Um, the Affordable Care Act, the statute, the statutory language, uh, requires the plans to offer cost sharing reduction. Um, the cost sharing reduction benefit is there at APTC. 
but there was some, there has been some legal challenge to whether or not the statutory language continuously appropriated funds for the purpose of making those payments to the health plans. So put another way, oh, and just quickly, I guess I'm sorry, I should be clicking through while I'm talking here. These are the benefit designs, so as an example, uh, this enhanced Silver 94 plan, the medical deductible is only $75, um, and the primary care visit, as an example, is five dollars which is extraordinarily important. So if I'm making $17,000 a year, and I want to go see my doctor, $40 might be a lot of money. It might actually be prohibitive. It might, it might pro prohibit me from wanting to go. But a $5 copay, generally the cost of a bus pass, uh, we think that makes that healthcare attainable. Okay, so. There were some legal challenges to whether the statutory language of the Affordable Care Act required the federal government to make the cost-sharing reduction payments to the plans. There's no question the plans are required to offer the benefits, but some question as to whether or not the government should have to pay for them. I want to break apart for you quickly. That is mutually exclusive of APTC. So the monthly premium subsidies, absolutely appropriated in the statute, um, nothing, no, no challenge to them whatsoever. They're good. Yes, sir. For what time period? Twenty eighteen or beyond? Um, the relative APTC. In the, uh, I, there's no major challenge to the APTC. That would, it's the cost sharing reduction is an issue, right? So, in California, the cost sharing reduction payments for a year represent about a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. The Trump administration has said during the 2017 plan year, they're continuing to make the cost sharing reduction payments on a month by month basis. Um, and they have given exchanges like Cover California no assurance that they would continue to make those payments in 2018. It would be hard to sell anything where you were offered to give someone something but weren't gonna get paid for it. Um, some of the plans across the nation and in California express concern that they might be in a position to offer coverage to uh, or offer benefits to consumers that, they, that would you know, represent a billion dollars in the basically wouldn't get paid for. So Cover California this year developed essentially two sets of rates. Um, a set of rates that are the normal set of rates that we've already talked about. And then a set of rates that allow the health plans to build a surcharge on top of the silver metal tier that would allow them to recover the, the cost necessary to, live, to deliver the cost. I am a little more today. You're right. Uh, that would allow them to um, recover the cost to deliver the cost sharing reduction payments. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to call that the CSR surcharge. I can say it again. <laughs> The second set of rates is one in which we work with the plans and the regulators to allow the plans to develop a essentially a surcharge on top of the silver metal tier only that allows them to recover the cost necessary to deliver cost sharing reduction benefits. So hold on, let me let me just go a little bit tiny bit further if I could, because I, I can see I haven't done well enough yet. And uh, but I'll get there. Um, there is an average weighted, a weighted average increase, or there's an increase for the products across the marketplace. There is an extra cost that is being proposed on top of silver products only that would fund CSRs through premiums, essentially. That is a best worst, that is a best worst option um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the reasons it's, it's the best and the worst is as you know, APTC is calculated based on the second lowest cost silver plan. So as silver premiums increase, so then does APTC. And for the vast majority of consumers, the additional surcharge that would be applied because of the cost sharing reduction um, funding issue, it would be mitigated largely or completely by that rate rise in APTC. Uh, the Commission's 
research which indicated that in 2018, if the federal government pays for the cost sharing reduction benefits across the nation, they would pay approximately $10 billion. If they don't pay, the, the associated rise in APTC would be about $12 billion. So they would actually pay more if they don't fund the cost sharing reductions. Um, there, I have a, uh, this slide indicates what the surcharge would be for each of the plans. Again, the distribution of cost sharing reduction benefits is different for each plan. So this would sort of be the surcharge by carrier. The last point I'll make. Questions I guys have a few. There's about 40,000 consumers on current California's marketplace who are enrolled in a silver product who don't receive APTC. And so if I'm a consumer getting subsidies and the CSR surcharge is applied, my subsidies go up, I see little or no increase in what I pay to agree with. If I'm a consumer who's not receiving subsidies in a silver product and the surcharge is applied, I see it all. I have to pay that entire increase, right? Um, we worked again with the plans and the regulators to create a silver product off exchange. It's nearly identical to our silver product on exchange. The one tiny difference is it's $5 more for an ambulance copay than this new product. And it will not have the CSR surcharge. So if I don't receive subsidies, I want to remain in a silver product, I could. Is there, I could purchase a gold product, I could look at a bronze product, um, but I could also go off the exchange and purchase my silver product without the surcharge. I talked a little bit about the September 30th date earlier, and so I just want to close that loop and then I'll have to answer your questions. Um, California has indicated to the federal government that we would delay the final decision on our rates until September 30th, which would allow Congress to take action to legislatively fund the cost sharing reductions for future years. I'm not, uh, Peter said, so I'll just do it here. Peter said that has better than a snowball's chance, but not an excellent chance of happening. Uh, there are some things that have to be done in DC, and the big one I think on most people's minds is the CHIP reauthorization, which is largely enjoyed by partisan support. It has to be renewed by September 30th. Uh, there is an opportunity for Congress to take some action to statutorily fund cost sharing reductions. That's obviously the best case scenario Then the entire CSR surcharge discussion we just had goes away. And, um, and, and we'll just go to market with our normal rates. Uh, but we think protecting the plans and creating stability in the marketplace for our consumers was extraordinarily important. Uh, and so given that importance, we think the CSR surcharge is a best worst way to make sure that there's stability in the marketplace for 2018 if in fact the government elects to not fund the cost sharing reduction in subsidies. Okay, our first question I've seen you hand up all this. Go ahead. Sorry about that. No, it's okay, it's good. So do I understand correctly that the extra money that's gonna fund the CSR if it's not funded by the government is going to fall just on the silver plan people on the exchange that don't get a subsidized silver? No. Um, but thanks for the clarification. I have the CSR surcharge is applied to all silver tier products across the board. But the people that get subsidies, they get the APT, they get the subsidized ones. Did, didn't you say that their tax credit would pretty much offset it? Yes. So, but the people that don't get a subsidized silver, they're not really offset by the? They're not offset by it. This is why we created this off-exchange product, because this off-exchange product doesn't include the surcharge. So if you don't want to look at gold as an option, as an example, um, on the exchange, you could move off the exchange by the identical silver product without the surcharge. Okay, so the people with a non-subsidized silver, don't they still get some tax credit? They just don't qualify for the enhanced silver, but they're still getting a tax credit, and if they went off the exchange, they'd lose that tax credit. Oh, I'm sorry, so no, no now we're just, totally understand what you're saying. Uh, when I say subsidized, I mean getting monthly assistance to pay my premiums. So, 
the CSR surcharge is going to be borne by everyone on the silver tier. Getting subsidies, not getting subsidies, it's evenly applied throughout the silver tier. Um, if I'm not getting any financial assistance from the government whatsoever, I can go off exchange and purchase the same product without the surcharge. Great. So, uh, for the, uh, for the silver 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 they are in silver plan, but not qualify for the CSR like a silver seventy. Uh, will the rate be the same? Uh, if in the in exchange or off exchange, will the rate be the same? Right. Again, okay, no. If the answer is no, the on exchange silver seventy would have the CSR surcharge applied. The mere product off exchange would not include the surcharge. Okay, so I'm like uh, silver. Oh, okay, hold on. Uh, okay. Hi. Hi. So, I, just to clarify, so the people who would want to move from the exchange are the people who would not be receiving APTC credit, and the only people who can actually enroll them in an off exchange product would be the agents. Correct. Right? That's largely correct. Uh, actually, carrier, I mean, consumers can enroll directly from plants too, but 90% of enrollment happens off exchange from agents. Um, I would also say I, we're not telling people to go off exchange. Um, there, they, I would, I would seriously consider looking at gold option. I, you know, I would look at other options. But if, if in fact silver is the place to be, then yes, off exchange is an option. Could I follow up on that? Because I, I get confused easily. If someone, excuse me, um, if the off exchange silver would be better, how does the enroller help the consumer to shop and compare that way? If we're saying oh, um, because of the surcharge and you're not getting the um, cost share reduction, but you still want the silver, how are you going to compare what's on Cover California with off-exchange product? Um, it, that is a fantastic question that we continue to look at. Our shopping compare tool will not include the off-exchange premium um, relative to that product. Um, how particularly we help you help consumers is something we're still working on. Um, it's possible we won't have to work on it at all because the government will fund it. Um, but so just more to come on that. So I want to clarify this that potentially effective October 1 we'll see new plan launch by the plants, you know, by all the carriers, because of the deadline of September 30th, the off exchange civil level plan isn't quite announced just yet. Well no um, not exactly right. Uh, both sets of rates and all the products from 2018 are currently at the regulators' bill. Uh, we, there will be a the decision on September 30th will be move forward with the CSR surcharge or not. Everything else will remain exactly the same. Uh, I mean, we're set to go for 2018. The only question left is whether or not the silver tier includes the surcharge or not. Everything else will be is ready to go. Right, so as far as the plan benefit for the off exchange, those are not being released at this time yet. By any plan. Well, our, uh, the off exchange benefits that are the mirrored products that cover California acquires Correct. are absolutely publicly available on the regulators' websites. They're, uh, they're being reviewed currently. There's no secrecy relative to the mirrored products off exchange. Right, what I'm saying is the carrier level, they have not been released yet as of today. Correct. I, I will have to plead the fifth on this one, but only so much is that I'm not, what's going, what goes on off the exchange in our non year products, I'm not for right? So, so what I'm saying is, we don't have any information on the mirror off exchange plan as of today. What so information specifically are you ready for? What are the plan benefits? Oh, they are, no, that is incorrect. The rates are 100% available. Uh, they've been released to the regulators, and regulators publish them on their websites. It's also on our board website. Well, that's also the regulator. Not on the carrier level. That's not true. You tell me where to look that information up. As of today, I don't have any plan from any carriers about the mirror off exchange plan. So I'm asking, are those plans supposed to be released October 1? 
Um, the benefit designs, the premiums, the, the plans at large are completely set. Um, I get that. The, they won't go into production relative to shopping a shopping environment until sometime in early October. I get that. So what what is it that I'm, I am just so the what I want to know is what set in stone required of the carrier to announce these plans to us. Um, that once the regulators are done reviewing the rates in a hand. After reviewing the rates, right. so it's September and, the right. out, and we have the September 30th deadline has expired. Then we will know absolutely the specific products will be put and the specific prices will be put on the shelf. So well, that answers the question. October one will be the restate. Great. Right. I'm curious. Possible. Sorry, that took me so long. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Any other questions about the surcharge? Otherwise, I'm going to fly through a few more slides and get you after. Yeah. We're just wondering how. Clients who are in that situation are going to know when all of a sudden they see these giant raises and they're. I'm going to talk about the renewal flow after the break, so if it's okay, I'll, I will. Um, I'll get to that. Other CSR questions? No, okay. okay. Um, here in San Francisco, the weighted average increase for consumers is 6.6%, about half of what you see across the state. Also, here in San Francisco, if consumers move to the lowest cost plan in their middle tier, they would see a decrease in their premiums, or put another way, they could pay less. But here's the premium increase you could see across each of the products offered in San Francisco County. It also shows you the distribution of enrollment in 2017 across those products. This is the price position for every plan in every metal tier in San Francisco County. Um, I think what's important to note here is that if I was in a silver product, a silver Anthem PPO in 2017, and I don't actively renew my coverage, I'll be passively renewed into the Chinese Community Health Plan HMO in 2018. So again, moving from the Anthem product to the lowest cost product in the metal tier. And this chart just makes that really easy to see. How is that going to be communicated? Through the renewal process, and again, I'll go through renewal messaging when I get to renewal. Um, a couple other counties we'll go through here quickly for you. 8.2% for Contra Costa, a little bit of a reduction in premium if consumers shop at renewal. Um, the premium increases by the carriers that are offered and the products that are offered, including the distribution of enrollment in that product. Price position. Again, just to note, on the process example, if I was in a bronze plan, let's say, with Anthem, I'd be passive renewed into the Kaiser product. Alameda County, 8.3% premium increase, all well below state average. Products and price position. Again, Kaiser being the exclusive. Passive renewal path for the Anthem folks in Alameda County. Santa Clara County, Region 7, 10.4% uh, uh, premium increase. Uh, huge savings here, 8.7% of consumers move to the lowest cost plan in their middle tier. Um, these consumers get to keep Anthem this year. Premium increases by the carriers. And price position by middle tier. Region 8, San Mateo County, 4.3% weighted average increase, again, well below the state average. Uh, a reduction in premium of consumer shop to lowest cost metal tier in their, um, lowest cost plan in their metal tier, rather. The rate changes uh, by each of the carriers by percent, and also the distribution of enrollment for those carriers. And again, the price position of each of the carriers by metal tiers. Again, just note here, if you're an Anthem product uh, and don't make an active change of renewal, you'll be passively renewed to a Kaiser product. 
Last year we provided for you guys in every rating region an index of all of the uh, contracted hospitals for each of the products being offered. Um, we got some really great feedback on that, and so we're doing that again this year. It's going to look something like this. It's not quite ready for you yet, but when you get this deck, you will include that directory. A um, couple last points really quickly. Last year, we began a process of assigning a primary care doctor to every consumer who enrolled in California. And that included PPO and EPO enrollees. Certainly, it's fair to say that that was not meant as a gatekeeper for those products, but rather as a place consumers could go in order to get assistance um, in finding out where to go if they needed health care coverage, if they needed to utilize services. 99% um, of consumers were matched last year. We are going to continue that policy as we think it is a helpful and consumer friendly one. Uh, dental plans. There are two types of dental plans. Uh, pediatric dental, which is an essential health benefit and offered by all the carriers, and family dental, which we launched about two years ago. How many of you guys uh, are selling family? What? How many of you guys are selling family dental? Maybe it's all in, but it wasn't that important. <laughs> <A little bit. laughs> when some do, some, these are all the um, embedded P dental uh, products for each of the health plans across the state. These are the dental providers that are offering family dental on the exchange. Uh, let me finish just two more slides and then I'll... Uh, some keynotes about uh, the product offering, maybe you guys know this well. Uh, two types of products, DHMOs and DPPOs. Uh, and lastly, and then I'll take your questions, vision. Uh, vision is like dental and not like dental. Current California entered into contracts with IMED and BSP as a way to offer vision as an ancillary benefit to our consumers. It's not like dental in so much as that you cannot select it or purchase it through the CalCare's portal, but you can select it and purchase it um, directly from the carrier, and we have links to these carriers on our websites. Okay, I had a couple questions. You guys have been a really great crowd. I uh, will get you to a break after, but is there any questions on anything I've covered so far that I didn't get? Go ahead, right here. I have so many questions, but I never know where to find the information on the dental. Like a couple people I've signed up, they said they found out that the, all the dentists were in LA, or you know, there were just it's not. I don't know where the training is to understand all the dental plans that are offered. I also don't know when people can get on and get off. Sometimes they get on, then they hate it and they want to get off, or sometimes they didn't sign up and then they want to get on, and can they get on six months later? So I don't know all the rules about dental or where to find the information. So just don't leave, because in the second half of this, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about our resources and toolkits, and I promise to get there for you. Young lady right here. Is my assumption is that these are young new dentists that are trying to build a practice. That these are, if someone has been seeing a dentist and maybe they've had Delta Dental through a, a, an employer plan, this may not be the dentist they've been seeing. So I, I'm trying to figure out how to advise people. I, the dental products are uh, regulated by, uh, have, you know, the, the networks rather are regulated the same way that health plan networks are regulated. Uh, it is true to say that uh, different product offerings have different networks. That is absolutely the case. Uh, how you, uh, and also the carriers, dental carriers, just like health carriers, have provider networks on their websites that are aimed to give you some indication of who's in the network versus that network. So through the shopping process, uh, there is an opportunity to learn what's there and what's not. Someone doesn't have it in us, and they don't know. They don't know which to choose. Um, I think, okay, fair enough. Okay, guys, you are a lively bunch. I can't wait for round two. Right? Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> it is there for two years. It has not gone away. It's only gone away for people that have used it. If you haven't used it, if you've got an employer that has not used and filed that tax credit, they're still eligible for up to two years. Everybody thought it went away after two years. It didn't go away for people that haven't filed for it. So if you've got a client that can actually qualify for those tax credits, it's a big deal. We've got a lot of veterinary offices, doctor's offices, lawyer offices, doctors and dentists. 
they usually, their office staff doesn't make a lot of money. This is a great option for them because they can pay for those premiums and get a tax credit back when they file their tax returns. So, question, John? Uh, is any of that in jeopardy at this point in time? At this point, we have not heard that that's going away. Um, the one thing, and this is just conjecture from my, my belief, we have a Republican-controlled office. They like tax credits usually for small businesses. They're pretty, yeah, they're pretty small business friendly. So can't say for, for positive, but yeah, we'll see. Competitive commissions. Something that's going to be happening. Is everybody uh, everybody's aware of the anthems pulling out of the individual market for the most part? They got a few few markets are going to stay in. But not only direct or with CC, uh, CCA, Cover California, they're going to be pulling out. What you're going to see is a lot of those possible individuals that are on Anthem plans, they might be small business owners. A lot of small business owners from 2014 when the ACA went in, they disbanded their group plans and had them and their employees enroll on individual plans. Well, a lot of them might be on those Anthem plans. This is a good opportunity for you to relook at those clients that are on individual that have to make a choice and make a move because we're an option for them, because they can go back to a group plan, get a full network PPO, throw in a national plan, and, and really take care of their employees. The other interesting thing, as you guys probably well know, special enrollment period, right? Coming up, November 15th and December 15th, if you've got a small group that can't meet participation or contribution requirements, they can enroll that one month period from November 15th to December 15th for a January 1st effective date. When do those anthem plans go away? January 1st, right? Might be a really good option for you guys. So keep that in mind when you're talking to your clients. It's a really good op opportunity for them to get back into the group side of things. Competitive commissions. Um, you know, the great thing about our products, we're still paying at a higher level, 6.5% downgraded for those groups that are less than 50 and enrolled. So keep, keep us in mind. It's a great way to segment and augment your revenue. All right, we talked a little bit about our general agents. The ones we have here in the Bay Area, Claremont, uh, LASI, Rogers Benefits, Warner Pacific, and Dickerson's mostly Southern California, but they might have some presence up here with their rep. Take advantage of them. They, get, they do a great job. All right, so most people aren't aware that there are actually two portals for Covered California. One's the Cal Here's portal that you're probably all really familiar with on the individual side. We also have a group enrollment portal that's been live since 2015. You can enroll all your groups online. It's a great system, works really well. The other things that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be launching later this year a full agent, employer, and general agent options that are gonna be able to do administration functions, ads and deletes for employees, pulling invoices, paying their premiums online. So that whole functionality is gonna be coming out in the next couple of months. You'll be able to go in and find all your clients on the portal and be able to administer and, and have your, you and your clients do the administration right online. You don't have to worry about having them fill out the apps and send them in and fax them or email them or whatnot. It'll all be on the portal, so we're really excited about that. We're also developing some API feeds from some of our, our uh, general agent partners and HRIS systems. If you're familiar with eCentral, some of those companies that do online benefit uh, administration, we're gonna be working with them to feed directly into our system. So, Really excited about that. It's going to really cut out some of that middleman and some of those headaches for you. Um, so can't wait. The interesting thing on the federal side, there was a big announcement a few months ago. It said small groups no longer avail available to enroll online through the shop. Well, we're not shop, quite frankly. We're covering California for small business. So, but it was interesting. They're downgrading their portal. We're enhancing ours in California. Just another separation from what we're doing on the feds versus what we're doing here in California. All right, so this is a little more information on the portal. Uh, take advantage of it, it's funny. We asked about what, you know, how we're gonna get this message out to a lot of our agent partners and where we're gonna do the training. Where are the trainings all posted? Anybody wanna pick guess? YouTube. <laughs> so they literally, we did all these trainings, we posted them online, they're on YouTube. So. Um, we'll be sending out links for everybody to kind of log on. It's funny how social media is kind of infiltrated just about every part of our lives. All right. Um, the other thing that we did was the agency contract. So um, just wrapping it up here in a few seconds. So agency contract, for those of you who have multiple people in your office, 
This is a great way to have everybody roll right up on the interagency. You've, you've probably seen these out. They started coming out in July. They've got the next the next couple of waves, so make sure you guys take it. Don't disregard these emails. So take a look at it. All right. So we talked a little bit about regional sales. Gina Poon's in the back. She handles San Francisco, North, uh, North Bay, and down the peninsula. So we're here to help. And we've got another, uh, we've got our inside sales team that handles questions. If Gina and myself were out, you can always go to them. We've also got the Agent Service Center, which we're probably very familiar with, and as far as submission and quotes. So uh, just want to wrap it up. Thank you guys for taking some time today. Uh, and maybe I've got time for a couple of quick questions if, uh, if anybody's got one. Cool. Well, thanks again. John, you had the only question. Awesome. Thank you for uh, asking. And uh, I'll hand it back over to Drew. Thanks again, guys. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, got a bunch of information to run through here in the next 50 minutes. Um, in the spirit of being nimble and not having a slide, but having breaking news, as it were, it seems as though. Um, uh, I spoke with our executive director about five minutes ago. It, it seems as though uh, you will start to hear in the news maybe today about a bill that's working its way through the Senate. Um, it's being called the Graham Cassidy bill. Uh, that would is not so dissimilar to some of the bills that had failed in the Senate previously. Um, it seeks to convert uh, much of the funding for Medicaid and uh, Cover California to block grants. Um, the text was released this week, and it could uh, end up on the Senate floor as early as today or sometime next week because the Senate is still in session for a vote. Very uncertain that it uh, has the votes to pass in the Senate. That said, however, I bring it up to you only to remind you that even if um, the bill were to move, there is absolutely no change that would happen for the 2018 plan year in the bill. So, um, as I started this, public policy takes a lot of time, change takes time. Uh, these quick moving bills often um, find hurdles that they need to overcome. Uh, the ACA will be back in the news if it's not already, and what we need to do collectively is to remind the people that we serve that change takes time, but what does not happen overnight is the possibility of having an accident and needing to go to the hospital. And so the importance of getting health care insurance can't be understated, and we should focus on the here and now, the 2018 plan years, and doing the good work that we've been doing for the last almost five years of getting people at open coverage. I know that will be challenging as political rhetoric and news coverage makes uh, folks have questions. But all in all, we're focused on the here and now, and uh, we'll continue to do so while also continuing to inform those policy discussions. Okay, that was my public service announcement for the day. Renewal. Um, given that uh, we are waiting until September 30th to finalize the rates for the marketplace, we think we should be able to start our renewal process on October 11th. Um, we're not guaranteeing absolutely that that will be our start date, but it's beginning to look quite likely that the renewal process will start on October 11th. Important to remember that consumers have until December 15th to make a change that becomes effective for January 1st coverage. Now, of course, consumers have to the end of open enrollment to make a change generally, but if they make their change on December 17th, that change will become effective on February 1st. So, renewal starts sometime October 11th or shortly around there consumers have to the end of open enrollment period in order to make changes. There's two modalities of renewal, and I know you know this well, but there's active renewal, which are consumers who come to the marketplace, they update their information, they have their eligibility redetermined, and then they shop for a new plan or they look at their options and they make a plan selection. That's an active renewal. We encourage consumers to actively renew to see what options are best for them. For every consumer, in Covered California's marketplace, if they do not actively renew, they will be passively renewed into either the same product that they're in this year, or if that product is not available, the lowest cost product in their mail team. 
uh, in August, we began sending notices to consumers uh, a small starting next year to the individual markets. Uh, but we really encourage someone who is in little treatment, they're pregnant, um, with a young child that's seen a specialist, and if they're, they're having trouble continuing that care this next year, call the plan, work with the plan first, and if you're not able to get that resolved, you can come to the GMAC So a couple of other consumer protections that have taken place over the last really two years, I'll, I'll talk very quickly about some of the ones that you should be aware of. Um, AB 72 is a new law that was passed last year that prohibits surprise balance billing. So if you've ever had someone come into you that did everything right, they looked at the provider directory, they went in, they had a procedure done, and then surprise, they get this big, devastating bill. Um, and many of us probably know someone that either you know, had, had, was financially devastated or had this bill, had to go to collections, it was on their, on their credit. Um, and so there's a lot of protections around surprise balance billing that took effect July 1st, 2017. We have a fact sheet on our website you can look at if you have questions or you hear about someone being a bill. It should not be happening for the most part starting July 1st, 2017. So this is for someone who went to an in-network facility, so in the directory it's being a network, that someone like an anesthesiologist provide a service and they're not in the network. There also are some, some other requirements around if you have a PPO, you want to go out of network. You now need to get consent 24 hours in advance. Um, so now I'm really getting in the weeds and getting complicated, and I don't want to confuse you anymore. So just know that we have a lot of resources. You don't have to have all the answers. That's where you can come to us. Check out our website at healthhelp.ca.gov for our phone number. Um, there are also timely access standards in the law that apply to both the individual, the small group market, and Medi-Cal. I will tell you that the word month is nowhere in there. So there are timely access standards that you should be able to get an appointment, in most cases, in less than about 14 days. Um, I put up a slide with our timely access standards. We have a fact sheet, and this is where everybody starts taking up their phone. Um, and so part of this is just we want you to be aware that consumers should not be waiting months to get an appointment in most circumstances. Um, I already talked about continuity of care. So SB 137 is the provider directory bill. Um, and I will tell you that accurate provider directories has been uh, a source of frustration for most of us. How hard can it be to have accurate information in a provider directory? Um, I will tell you it's very complicated. Um, we at the department, I spent most of last year working on how we can make provider directories more accurate. Um, what you need to know is that consumers should be able to reasonably rely on the information in their provider directories. Um, starting with the passage of SB 137 last year, the provider directories that are online on a plan's website are updated weekly. That is the most current information that is available. If you are helping a client and you go to the plan's website, you see a provider on that website, they go to see that doctor and then they get a bill that says, I, we're not in the network, they're entitled to file a grievance, then they can come to the department and they should not pay more than their in-network cost sharing amount. So this is huge and this is the result of a lot of the confusion that we all lived through in those first couple of years of open enrollment. Um, someone had asked about panel status, uh, whether they're accepting new patients. We develop standards for the provider directories, so they're going to start to look a little different. Uh, we develop standards that the plans have to implement by January 1st. And one of the criteria that they have to do is have the panel status, and we actually said what the categories are going to be. So they're going to start to look and feel similar, which should make it easier to compare. Uh, and so that information is going to be available. But I, I, I'll give you one suggestion. If this is an issue you have a lot, if you help someone go to the plan's website to find a provider, do a screenshot, print that page, keep it. If they are really concerned that this doctor's not going to be in their network and then they have a problem, you can send that in to the Global Council Department. Um, so just a couple of quick notes how to stay engaged with us. I have fact sheets. I have Cards. If you want information about our health center and the resource that we can be, I also have con uh, contact information for Gil Moran, who is our outreach officer. He is doing presentations throughout the state 
Um, he does this in English and Spanish. And I have cards as well, so if you have any questions or we can be helpful, please come and see me after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have one question, I'm sorry. Is there any rule about how often doctors can get off a plan? Like, do they have to like sign on to be on the plan and then stay on it an entire year? Because we're helping people shop for a plan. They find their doctors are on there. Then by the time they go see them, they're not on there anymore. But it's too late to change plans. Yeah, this is why I, my best tip is do a screenshot. So if you print that out and say, I went and looked at the directory, you know, on September 1st, and I made an appointment on September 15th, um, I think there's a good case to be made there. I will tell you that most providers sign contracts that are at least for a year. Um, they do go for sometimes negotiations and extensions of contracts, but for the most part, we don't see providers that are hopping on and off directories um, monthly, for example. What sometimes will happen is that panel status will change, and that's where these standards are going to help, I think, to, to give more accurate information to be able to display it across there. Um, I would encourage you again, if you are helping someone that's just struggling to find a doctor, call the plan first and say, can you help me? I am your enrollee. I need to find a doctor. And if you're not able to get any help with that, these are issues that we're able to resolve pretty quickly by just a phone call to our health center. So I would encourage you to, to help your clients give us a call and try to help. Do you have any questions? Last one, and then I'm going to accept all the questions. I know, and I'm sorry. Is there any regulation on specialists, particularly like, you know, like dermatologists or that sort of hospital uniform? I need to talk to you guys for three hours about all the legal requirements. There are both um, time and distance standards and geographic standards. They're not as specific for specialists. Um, we do an annual review. Part of what we do for Cover California is reviewing the adequacy of the network to make sure that their own network can be okay as long as you have enough. Um, but again, if you have someone who is not able to get timely access to the care, appropriate care when they need it, file agreements with the department. Okay? So our, I am our complaint for, our independent health review complaint for, is literally four pages. The first two pages, we need one signature from the consumer authorized us to um, get their medical records. The second two pages is where they can have an agent, a community-based organization, a caseworker, a family member, help them. It's called authorized assistant form. We need a second signature authorized to help them, and you can help them fill out the rest of the information. It's really easy. All right, hey. Give Mary a hand. Thank you, Mary. All right, so open at moment five. What are we doing? Uh, we're renewing our Life Care campaign to test very well, although we are adding some new assets to our portfolio this year, which we are very excited about, um, including the Life Can Change in an Instant um, theme. I'll tell you just quickly, uh, I saw a rough cut of our first TV commercial, uh, and these commercials are awesome. Uh, they're filmed, you guys know what a GoPro is, Yes. These actors are wearing these helmets, which are like a GoPro on steroids. So all of the um, film is shot from a first-person perspective. You never see the actor, but you can see their arms and legs. In a scenario, it's like a woman walking down the stairs in her home, and you can see a child's toy on the stair, and you see her step on it, and you see the beginning of a slip. You don't see what happens. Um, but you do have like a moment. Um, because they're, they're shot very well. There's my favorite, and I tell you it's my favorite because I have some real-world experiences, uh, someone peeling an apple with a knife, and you see the knife slip, uh, and you, you have a very, like, <clears throat> like uh, but you don't, see, you don't see anything bad, but they're very convincing. I tell you that's right, because when I was a little kid, I was cutting an apple like this. That does require stitches. Um, <laughs> that's um, so it's, it's our effort to make sure that consumers see the value of healthcare coverage, see that life can change in an instant. Uh, we do a, a ton of uh, focus groups and quantitative and qualitative analysis to understand con consumer sentiment. One of the things that we've learned is that there's a, a good chunk of consumers who think, well, I go to the gym and I eat healthy and I just don't need health insurance. And this campaign is meant to remind them that uh, even you can lead the most perfect lifestyle, but accidents happen, and so there's a health insurance. We're updating the CoveredCA.com website like we do every year, including now the home page will be mobile friendly, so it'll display correctly on phones and tablets and stuff like that, so we're very excited. How many of you guys are CECs uh, or CACs with non-agents? Wow. You guys are non-agents? Okay. Uh, let's see. Wow. Good. Welcome. 
So for the rest of you that are agents, you can tune me out for a second if you have not already. Um, but don't worry, I'll come right back to you. Uh, for CECs and CACs, certification and recertification has been launched. Um, the training is wildly improved, much shorter, and with way better content. The CEC training. Oh, I don't know how long it will take. I will take you. I took the test and I passed. So I know a few things. We also replaced the iPass portal um, that many of you guys knew and loved with the certification services portal. We're really excited about it. One of the things that I'm most excited about is uh, the iPass portal only had access for the primary and authorized representative. Now every CEC uh, has access to the, the new certification portal. Uh, this screen shows you uh, the entity homepage, including information about your entity, required documents. Uh, this would be a counselor portal homepage. So it would show you things you need to have done in order to become certified. Everyone can now update all of their own information. So some of you may recall the 19-page change request form that used to be filled out during this month. It's no longer. You just log into your portal and you make the changes in your portal. So that's a big deal. We're very excited about it. There are job aids available online. If you have questions, email address there for you to reach out to. Just as a tip for you guys, if you don't recertify, if you don't do research by December 31st, you become decertified. Um, I wouldn't wait till open enrollment period to do it, because it's shorter, but not short time. <laughs> to my friend's point of view. Um, I might try and just knock it out here before we so it's just for the tip. Okay, back to everyone. We have uh, service centers for agents, for CECs, and for covered California for small business. And they're a valuable resource, we think, for helping you help consumers. Um, like we did last year, we are going to increase the amount of staff at the service centers during the open enrollment period to help keep the call times low, and um, because we know that everyone will be busy. We are also working on, in the final stages of, a delegate. We want you to help on demand tool for the second open enrollment period. Uh, it's a tool where a consumer can give their zip code, their telephone number, and their name and request a phone call uh, for somebody, oh well, that's slide change, um, for somebody uh, to call them back, a certified voter to call them back. Um, it, it is an important tool, but we are doing more to make it better. So I know that there's been some challenges that some of you guys have shared with us. We have duly noted those. We don't have to spend time here talking about them. Uh, nevertheless, uh, with any good new tool, we have growing pains, and this one's no exception. Um, the Shop and Compare tool, um, again, a really important tool, should be available uh, on or around October 11th for the 2018 rates. This is another tool that I, I bring up in part to say it has some room for improvement. It's generally a very good tool. Um, I hear that people would like to use the back button or they would like to email proposals. to. I, I, so we, we have some things that we're working on. We will continue to work on those. Um, more to come. Storefronts. Uh, anyone here have a storefront? I know Simon does. Um, yeah, a few of you. If you guys are interested in a uh, storefront and you have uh, signage capabilities and a building that would work, uh, they are a great way to be noticed. Uh, Cover California has a brand. About 97% of people in California who are surveyed are familiar with it. We spent a great deal of money, as you can imagine, creating and uh, building the brand. And we want to give it to you for free. Uh, I think of it like this. The consumer will be sitting at home watching TV and see a covered California commercial where someone cuts himself with an apple. And then they will be driving to work the next day and they will hear on the radio and a radio ad saying covered California open enrollment. And then they will see your storefront. They will see the logo and be like, that's a place I can go. And that is actually put together a very effective strategy. So if you can have a storefront, uh, you apply online. Uh, Mark is also a pro storefront starter. So um, he can help you with that. Um, we have an event portal uh, for those of you that are navigators, you're required to utilize the event portal for the rest of you. It is a place where you can go place events. So maybe you're going to go to the farmer's market or you're going to go to the library and help people out and you want more people to be able to come find you during a certain time. You can go to the event portal and add an event. Please allow us two to three days 
in order to approve the event, but it is a resource for you guys to help people find you. The most important name on here is going to be Mark or Blake. Uh, Mark is here, so grab his card. But this is our entire field and accounts team whose job it is to serve you by region. I'm Adam is Mark's boss and Jamie is Adam's boss, so if you feel like uh, if you want to go up the food chain, they all have business cards with varying degrees of loneliness. Okay. Fabulous updates. Uh, it, during the 1707 release in July, we um, implemented the agency uh, arrangement in the Calhears portal where now we have an agency manager and then sub agents for all the other agents uh, or agency managers rather. This is the home page where you can see all of your active counselors. You can also add and edit counselors from the agency manager page. A bunch of resources are available on the website and those links right there. And, um, I'm, again, I should have some of your agents. Okay, um, if you haven't executed your new agency agreement yet, please, please, please do so. And the vast majority of you likely have. If you have questions about getting that done, you can go see Mark. Uh, really, uh, very important to get that. application since we had a calendar's application. Um, it's scheduled to deploy on September 25th where we will be completely updating the single streamlined application. We're going to, I'm going to click through some of these quickly. This is what the new renewal homepage will look like. Some of you guys remember the train tracks page or the breadcrumbs, whatever you called it. This is the new renewal page. It is, I always love this slide. Um, the application is now a smart application which just begs the question, was it done before? Um, nevertheless, it has pop-ups throughout. Um, it is quite user-friendly. Uh, this, believe it or not, is a test environment where we would see the actual flow of a consumer who you were helping renew, or was renewing themselves, uh, where there was no changes to the application information. As you can see, every single field is editable. Editable. Um, and um, every consumer in the household has their own fun little icon as a Ferris wheel. For those of you, you guys are experts. I don't have to play characters as much as you guys do, so that's a big change. Go ahead. Uh, quick question about the income section. I've noticed. Um, a lot of my clients will have like the a microphone. Oh, yeah. Um, so for the income section, I have a lot of people who like will move from job to job and their income is changing. Uh, but when we put in a monthly like income, the annual income is usually much less than what they're actually expected to make. So the math doesn't seem to really work. Um, and when we put in a projected income, the final application still shows the calculated income, but again, the math doesn't really seem to check out. Is there any like training that's specific to like the income section of the application? We definitely do, and we cover this in our SCP, but if memory serves, the, the new income section of the application at the very end allows for an override, uh, which, because I, I know income is, you know, Part of the challenge is the Medi-Cal eligibility rules are very different than the current California eligibility rules. You could win the lottery in January and then literally in February be Medi-Cal eligible. That, that is the way the rules work. <laughs> I'm going to make the rules. I'm just here to tell you what they are. Um, my sense is the new application does have an opportunity at the very end to override income with a flat monthly income that would provide for pretty consistent APTC despite the sort of changes. I, Mona, do we have something like that in our toolkit? Uh, oh, so see, we're getting real-time responses. Give me just a second, we'll circle back. All right. I bet it did. Good. Good information. Um, the, um, oh, you have a question? Uh, 
other but let me introduce you to that one. <laughs> Whatever one's on my phone. Okay, have so uh, again, just to recap, everyone gets a cool icon, all the fields are editable. Um, the one thing I should note is that the redesign ends at eligibility determination submission. So when you see the eligibility determination, it'll be in that classic view, and plan selection screens will not change. This is just the application screens changing. Go ahead, Derek. Can I piggyback on that income? Um, I don't know if it's only me, but when you change the income, you go back to income and then and then it shows the amount, but at the end of it, it still shows the old amount. You can try to override all you want, it's still the old amount, which forces you to delete uh, that. I, I haven't filled out an application in a long time, probably since the first open enrollment period, <laughs> just to see what it was like. Uh, if you guys are finding these like big bugs, I don't know how you're, how, like, if you're communicating them with us, uh, but like I would have known this. And so, uh, if you have these like, well, yeah, this functionality ought to work, but just doesn't, um, I do encourage you to let us know like in real time so we can look at these. We'll do some research on this and sort of back because um, that seems wrong. Uh, but but so I don't know what, how fast we can fix it because I didn't know it was a problem, but thanks for the feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might want to listen to the calls that support like because you have these long dialogues. About it. Did you know this, Mona? No, oh, okay. So Mona manages our call center, so I have. I, uh, go ahead, young yeah, lady. Are we still going to have available paper applications? Because there's quite a few times when I find that's better for people than online, even though I love doing it online. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and uh, go through. Um, this is uh, for starting a brand new application and the new application flow. Um, again, smart app with checkpoints throughout. Um, I can continue to answer your questions now while these videos play, but this behind us is going to walk through what a new application create, a uh, new account creation looks like. Thank you for being a little more proactive, I hope, this year and um, staffing up the call center ahead of time so we don't have those long waits. And I want to compliment the call center for enrollers and agents. They have been unbelievably patient, informative, and helpful. And they probably don't get thanked enough. Thank you. Okay. Any, uh, yes, uh, so Mark, you want to this video is really exciting, but there's no music. And I've seen it once or twice. Uh, will there all be enhancing the communication between Coverage Hoffman and Medical? Because I feel like every time we have a client that we apply with and they end up being Medical eligible, it takes weeks for Medical and Coverage Hoffman to talk to each other. So then we have to conference call both of y'all to actually like help the client actually have coverage. We are working on it, and we even have some Medi-Cal folks here today, I think, so um, things are going in the right direction, but in the spirit of not having a magic wand, I don't think it would be perfect for the moment. A young lady in the back has a question. Yeah, uh, my name is Aline, and uh, when we report a change, then we go to the continue, 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 then we get to a series of questions, sometimes two pages long. Yes, with they don't pages. make any yeah. sense. I know, I'm sorry. And, and the drop-down menu don't reflect any of the reasons, so we have to pick something else. And I don't know what to do with that data, but it's all false data. I just want to let you know. <laughs> Thank you for the feedback. Uh, just as a reminder, and I'm going to try and uh, speak through the rest of these quickly, um, the application flow is totally different than the questions we're asking. Is that your password? If you go to this website right here, or right there, again, this link will be available to you when we send out the slide deck. You will enter in your username, 
you don't know your username, but in a CC underscore your license number, CC underscore your license number, you will click verify via email because you don't know your security questions and click the email that you want to send. It'll say an email has successfully been sent. You have three minutes to find this email. <laughs> don't have to be serious. You have three minutes to find it, and it's very likely in your spam folder. So don't answer the phone, don't get a lot. We know that covered California is confusing sometimes, that health insurance is confusing, that our system is confusing. Uh, health insurance is confusing. We put a ton of time and effort in developing toolkits and webinars and resources for you guys to use. Spend one hour between now and renewal sitting in front of your computer and going through this toolkit page. Please, you will find information that you have asked me today that uh, has been there forever that will be so extraordinarily helpful. Please, please, please go do it. Um, if you're not getting our e-alerts and briefings, you can email us at outreachandsales.cover.ca.com. It's how we communicate the most important stuff. So if you don't get it, you should. If you, if your kids want to watch a movie, you turn on a webinar, they will be just totally captivated and you will be learning stuff about work. Uh, no, joking aside, webinars are recorded and posted on our website there for you all the time. We have a survey. I don't see the posters, but you might have gotten a little leaflet when you walked in. Just get a, no, no leaflets, no posters, okay. Uh, oh, they're at the table. So basically, I enjoy traveling around 20 cities in a month. It makes me feel like a rock star. Like every day I'm like, what city are we in and what day of the week is it? My staff has to put up with me because I, I say that every day. Uh, yeah, but anyways, we do this tour because we want to help you. The survey helps us find out if we're doing that or not. It helps these presentations be better. If you thought the presenter was amazing, the content was fabulous, take the survey. If not, you can skip it. Um, uh, with that, I want to thank you guys all very much.